Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Interview with Experts Season 7, probably presented to you by the Malaysian Dental Student Association, MDSA. I am Darren, a representative of the Academic and Research Bureau of MDSA. In this episode today, we are very honoured to have you with us, Dr. Lee Sun Boon. Dr. Lee graduated as a gold medalist in his BDS degree in the University of Malaya in 1989. He then later obtained his master's degrees of science in implant dentistry in the University of Warwick in the UK. He is also a former clinical lecturer of the University of Central Lancashire in England and the McGann Postgraduate School of Dentistry in the United States. Dr. Lee is also a visiting professor in Sabita Dental College in India and an adjunct honorary lecturer of the Faculty of Dentistry in Massa. I am currently in Dr. Lee's clinic and let's proceed with the interview. So, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon. Yeah. So, first, on behalf of MDSA, we would like to thank you for accepting our invitation mm. to be our special guest today. It is my honor, thank you. So, now let's proceed with the questions. So, Doctor, throughout your career, you have been to many countries such as the US, UK, or India, mm. and to be the visiting professors or even studying in some of them. Mm. Do you think any of these countries provide an upper hand in terms of a- exposure to the latest technology? In my opinion, I think the accessibility to new knowledge, new technologies are quite flattened. In other words, uh, all countries, including Malaysia, have uh, full access to this sort of uh, technology and also knowledge of the latest, uh, what they call it, updates or knowledge of the dentistry. So, doctor, so you mean like in each of these countries, they all provide equally good exposure? To the latest technology. Yeah, absolutely, right? absolutely. Because nowadays, in the we call it the information technology era or the internet era, no? uh, whereby information uh, move very fast. So whatever there has been uh, discovered or so raw invented uh, in the certain uh, countries, in advanced countries, can rapidly be uh, uh, what they call it uh, the updated or been uh, transferred or shared to the different part of the world. So it's just a matter of the dentist or probably the organizations or the association or the respective countries to take the initiative to, you know, to, uh, to facilitate this transfer of knowledge and uh, technology to their respective profession in the country. Oh, okay. Okay, so doctor, so now let's talk about Malaysia. And Malaysia are also offering postgraduate courses. Yes, so, indeed. Yeah, so do you think these postgraduate courses offered in Malaysia, they are as competent as the ones that are offered in the overseas, such as maybe the UK, UK or the US? Yes, certainly, because uh, we look at the contents, the curriculums, uh, and at the end of the day is that besides the knowledge, we also look at the, the intensity of the clinical training. So if you have these two components, uh, uh, that is uh, have the number of hours required, as well as the, the coverage, the wide coverage of the mm-hmm. curriculum, I'm sure the quality is equally good. So, doctor, so you mean even the postgraduate students that are produced in Malaysia, they are they can be as competent as the ones that are produced in the overseas, yes, right? Yes, I agree with that. Yes, definitely. Okay. okay, and doctor, now actually I've read a lot about you online. And Thank you. Yeah, and <laughs> and you are a respectable individual who's even a pioneer in implant dentistry, right? Uh, can you share with us your journey in terms of digitalizing dental implants in Malaysia? Oh, I have been practicing uh, implant dentistry for the last. Uh, Probably about twenty years. Yeah, I've been. I started practicing dentistry about thirty three years ago, nineteen eighty nine. So as far as as for the implant dentistry, I started probably about twenty years ago. Yeah, and at that time, the, there's no the availability of the digital technology such as uh, CBCT, for example. You no, know, I started practicing implant dentistry even before the arrival of CBCT into Malaysia. So. From then onwards, when the, the these uh, digital technology like CBCT, intro scanner, 3D printers, all this comes in, so it actually uh, allows me to look into the, uh, the the what they call it, the ability of this uh, digital technology to improve my treatment planning, predictability, and also increase the surgical safety for the patient. So. When I, when I realized that all these things is, it can help me uh, in terms of my clinical practice, obviously, I will not hesitate to learn it, to travel overseas, to acquire this knowledge as well as the skill to undergo trainings overseas and then bring back this technology into my practice to benefit my patients. Oh, I see. 
Okay, so now, doctor, like, we can agree that digital dentistry is getting more popular nowadays, right? So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but has are there any organizations or government in Malaysia that has, has implemented any schemes effort in order to digitalize dentistry? Uh, in, in terms of uh, incentive, I don't think so. It's more of a personal level. Of course, you also get these uh, associations, the dental associations that uh, will maybe uh, become more proactive in uh, inviting more speakers, organizing more uh, kind of seminars and conferences that uh, will have this type of uh, digital implant dentistry or digital dentistry as in general as a um, kind of main topics to sort of trigger or stimulate more interest among the general dentists or the specialists in Malaysia to learn about this uh, new trend of digital dentistry as well as to acquire the skill through you know, some kind of workshop or training or probably you know, excite them to travel overseas to acquire this uh, skill and knowledge. Oh, okay. Now, uh, despite, uh, despite the advancement of technology, we dentists so far, we cannot escape simple procedures such as restorations or extractions for our patients, right? Do you see these technologies replacing us dentists one day in all these simple procedures? Digital technology until this, uh, if you are talking about robotic, where automated, uh, or autom autonomous, uh, no, dentistry, I don't think it will come so fast. Uh, as far as my era is concerned, it will not come during my, you know, before I retire, see? So, uh, but as far, uh, as far as uh, the technology being used or being uh, employed by the dentists or the specialists, uh, it's already available here. It's already available here. But uh, some uh, group of uh, maybe some dentists are still behind in terms of adopting this technology. So we need to sort of those, especially those already into this uh, digital implant dentistry or digital technologies in dentistry, in their clinical practice, should actually encourage and also motivate and also to share the kind of knowledge and skill to our younger colleagues or to those who are still have not jumped into this bandwagon uh, to actually facilitate the whole profession moving towards to a higher level of adopting this digital technology which definitely will benefit the patients and also will definitely will benefit the quality of treatment and also will benefit the profession, the dental profession as a whole. So doctor, so what you meant is like that all these technologies that can replace us with all these simple procedures, they are already available just that the dentists, they are not adopting it yet, right? So it's not know. replacing the dentist. It's just that it's available for the dentist to use it, to embrace, employ, or use this uh, technology to improve the quality of the treatment to their patients, to increase the safety of the treatment, to reduce the risk and to make their treatment uh, more predictable, treatment planning more predictable, and also to make it more comfortable and also it's much, uh, it's much uh, so-called uh, higher quality of treatment that you can offer to your patients. Oh, okay. Okay, I understand. But as far as uh, replacing dentists, I don't think it will come yet. That means uh, we are talking about some kind of machine or auto-robots auto uh, that is going to replace. I don't think it will come so soon. Yeah? Well, definitely not in my generation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Probably not even your generation, so Darren. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Okay. So doctor, like implants, I think we all can agree that implants they are very costly, right? Compared to other treatments. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, of course anything that is modern, new, and then uh, technological driven definitely is more expensive. Just like uh, iPhone is definitely more expensive than the old you no know, Motorola phone yeah, and a yeah. phone right and a lot of yeah. phone see so we certainly cannot only look at the price uh, or the cost as a deterrent to acquire this uh, technology because as far as i'm concerned anything that benefits the patient should be adopted because at the end of the day is that as a clinician as a responsible clinician who cares for your patients you should use it all right of course it involves a little bit of investment. All right? I won't call it a cost, it's more of an investment that can give you a better return in terms of patient safety, predictability of your treatment, and also the quality of treatment improved. 
and then also the patient's uh, comfort uh, and also the, the so-called the, the final results will be more aesthetic, more functional and more predictable and also the number of visits for the patients to come back you know, by adopting this decision you know, will probably improve in terms of uh, more efficiency, more effective. But then, doctor, so if the patients are reluctant to go for implants, even though they are the most suitable choice of treatment, how do you convince such patients to accept the treatment? Well, we have to make them understand in a layman terms, yeah, all right, and uh, make them feel that as if uh, we care for them, number one, that is very important, and also is there are many benefits that they can uh, not obtain by you know, taking up um, these options, all right. Of course, we won't force them. This is just an option, right? It's an elective procedure. But we can share with them and open up their eyes about the the, the benefits that they can uh, they can get. For example, like if you do an implant instead of wearing a, a partial removal dentures, then the bone can be kind of maintained instead of being resolved away. As we know, if you wear partial dentures for a long time, you resolve away the bone, and then by then by the time they find that their dentures too loose. You no, know, it can't be salvaged anymore. It cannot be, uh, you know, corrected anymore. Then they have no choice but to go for implant option. Then that time the treatment will be more complex where they don't have enough bone. Then the implant treatment will require some major kind of uh, bone grafting. Then the cost also will increase. So in short, it could be the earlier or the the, the when the bed, when the bone the their patient's bone existing bone is in good condition. That's the best time to go for it. Right, rather than lose it and then come back later, then you're going to lose a lot of time and also the, the discomfort of wearing the denture and at the same time, your bone will be gone. Yeah? So in short, it's like, you know, uh, penny-wise, pound foolish, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, I totally understand. And now, doctor, like, uh, as we know, like, in our five years of our curriculum, what we learn may not be enough, right? So what are the advice that you can give for a dental student who wishes to aspire to learn and improve their knowledge beyond what's taught in the curriculum. Yeah, obviously in five years, uh, basically the, the your lecturers and all the teachers in the universities lay a strong foundation for you, right? As for you to move towards a uh, higher level where you can do more complex restorations uh, or prosthodontic work, or you, that will include like dental implants as, as one of the so-called options for your reconstructions or rehabilitation or recon or the so called restorations of your patients, uh, fix fixed restoration for your patients. So you need to uh, undergo or undergo some kind of training or take some kind of uh, uh, comprehensive course that allows you to uh, have the skill and knowledge to practice this type of thing. Right? And of course other areas as well, no other areas, whatever you learn in uh, dental school is just a foundation, fundamental, then you need to build on these foundations to go higher, to be more skillful, to be more knowledgeable, so that you can treat bigger uh, varieties of uh, conditions, uh, dental conditions that patients come to you for solution. So doctor, so you mean like the, the student itself, they should be proactive to look for courses that they are interested in in order to improve their knowledge, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. That is uh, on the on the so-called the, the motivating or driving side for the students who aspire to to be able to uh, practice um, wider scopes of in, uh, dentistry in general, alright? Even as simple as uh, some uh, restorative works that you may, you may learn it but you may not be able to practice it in the dental school. Then, when you are in the prior practice uh, or the specialist practice, you want to, you will encounter these are patients who require this sort of treatment. Then, if you have the skill and knowledge, then you particular, you can actually help them, right? So that is a one important thing. Of course, secondly, which I think the the wind of change that is blowing strongly in especially particularly in Malaysia is we know that the number of uh, young dentists or general dentist populations are increasing, right? So due to that competitions, right? So you need to be able to do wider varieties of uh, treatment options, you know, that you that the patient may need. So if you are only 
able to do certain small sections of the dentistry, then you'll find that uh, it's too competitive for you in terms of your practice. Now, here comes the most exciting part of the interview, the rapid fire round. Okay, yeah. doctor, I'll be asking you 10 questions and sure. you'll have to answer them as quickly as possible. Yeah. So, doctor, are you ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. Doctor, three words that best describes you. Workaholic, meticulous, maybe caring. Okay. So, doctor, if you're not allowed to take dentistry, what would your second option be? My second option will be a businessman. <laughs> okay. So, doctor, would you rather have class 4 amalgam filling on all your anterior teeth or two missing central incisors? Four amalgam restorations. Okay, restorations. <laughs> okay, so, doctor, would you want to be the, the most skilled dentist in the world or the friendliest dentist in the world? I want to be both. <laughs> okay. So, uh, doctor, who is your greatest person or mentor that has taught you the most? Professor Malcolm Harris. He's a uh, very famous oral surgeon and he's the one who is supervised by Masters of Science in the independent industry in the UC of Warwick. Doctor, what which is your most relaxing year throughout your BDS degree? I'm still looking forward to one of the relaxing year. Are you talking about the BDS? Yeah. Ah, the BDS. The most relaxing, of course, is year one. <laughs> okay, so doctor, do you think teaching others is more beneficial than studying more? Yes, definitely. When you teach others, you learn more. You know, because there are a lot of things that you will discover. Okay. So, doctor, what's your favorite method of coping with stress? Mm, sleeping. <laughs> so, doctor, would you rather work 15 hours a day, but you get to retire at the age of 35? Or would you have work-life balance and retire at the age of retirement? Yeah, I prefer to work 15 hours a, a day and retire as early as I can. So, if doctor, if you have one wish for every patient in the world, what would that be? Uh, to keep their smile, the best smile, for the, for the rest of their life. So, now, we have come to the end of, the, of this episode. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for being for me. It's my pleasure. So that concludes our interview with Expert Season 7. Thank we, you. We hope to see you guys next year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.